rejoice. Amen. Don't grow weary. Amen. Don't grow weary. Some of us feel the striving. Some of us feel the grinding of that race. And that's just part of, that's just part of it. You know, pastor says... His favorite verse is, what is it, John 16, 33? It says, in this world you will have troubles, tribulations. But take heart what I have. He's overcome. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When you feel those things in the race, you are, and you're pushing on, you're identifying with Christ in his sufferings. Amen. It's called suffering for a reason because it doesn't always feel pleasant. I want to share a scripture with you. And then, hey Brent, then can we play that first song please? Thank you. In just a moment here. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, do you, know, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It says, don't you know that you, you, yes, you, every single one of you are a temple. What are temples for? What's the purpose of a temple? It's for worship. You were made, you were created for worship. And you will worship something regardless if you want to or not. Your worship forms your identity. Think about that. What you worship forms your identity. It gives you a place of being in the world. It gives you a reason. Because we need a why. You need a why. God made you innately for a reason and that reason is a bit the big question mark why why do I exist without that how would we ever hear the voice of the Lord drawing us because you were designed specifically for worship I got this song that I want to play for you and I think they've got it so they can be up on the screen. But I want you to disengage from just being in a church service, from just going through the normal routines. And I want you to hear this song. I want you to hear it.
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Set it in your hearts today. Lord, I'm yours. Decide today. Lord, I'm yours. Settle it in your heart today. Put your doubts aside. Stop being pulled back and forth. And just let go and trust the Lord. I can't promise you that you won't suffer. I can't promise you that you won't go through terrible, horrible things in life, but he'll be with you right by your side. Amen. Amen. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they got thrown into a furnace, and the question I ask myself is, even if God didn't spare them from the flames, it was still, it was still worth it, because it still gave, it was still, even if they were, even if they would have been consumed by the fire. It would have been a testimony to God regardless. I wonder how many were thrown into the fire beside them. Maybe that burned up. But the testimony is just as strong before the Lord. Sometimes God does miracles in a way that we, that is outside of our scope of understanding, that defies all principles and laws of this nature. And sometimes he doesn't, but he's still good, and he's still worthy. Peter says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There are things in our lives that we have to, there are spiritual sacrifices we have to give to God. There are requirements of us. Psalm 127 says that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand Watch in vain. If God's with you, then who can be against you? I got a question for you, and this is an important question, and it probably could determine the fate of the future of this church. Do you believe God's going to build the house? Or are we doing it? Is God going to do it? Or are we going to do it? Who's going to build this house? See, I don't live in China. I don't live in South America. I live here. I live in this little town. So, and so do you. Who's going to build this house? Is it going to be us? Are we going to toil with our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own ways? Are we clever enough? Can you save a soul? Hmm. 
Ian Bounds is probably one of the most prolific writers on prayer in most recent times, and he said this. God's plan is to make much of the man. Far more of him than anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men who the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come upon machinery, but he lands upon men. He does not anoint plans, but he anoints men, men who are of prayer. I got this cup here. says something that's I put this is you know the old coffee cup but it says pray without ceasing first Thessalonians 5 17 prayer changes everything that might seem like a little thing but I try to keep it with me at all times because I've, I've come to understand something Without prayer, nothing changes. Oh, yeah, you know, the world, ambitions and things like that, but I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Do you want to be a part of the kingdom of God? It takes that. Where's Trevor at? Come here. Come here. The Word of God said, you can stay right there. I'm going to have you do a sweet illustration. So, in the Word of God, it talks about Jacob wrestling with God. He laid hold of God, and he didn't let go of God until he blessed him. And Jacob came through that trial with great victory. Trevor, in wrestling, we are a wrestling family. In wrestling, what is the very first, hopefully you get this right, what is the very first move every wrestler learns? A step of champion? A step of champions. Can you please illustrate the step of champions. No, a real one. All right, now show it fast. Come on. Okay. Thank you. That is the very first move That is the very first move you learn in wrestling. That is the very first way you engage any any opponent. It is the best, most proven way to take an opponent down. That I would liken prayer to. If you're going to do battle, your default, these, these young men and women, they ingrain it in their mind. They don't even consider what they should do. They do it because they're trained in it. And what we've lacked, church, is training. We, the very first instinct for everything should be prayer. Prayer is the foundation from which we grow. Prayer is the lifeblood of the church because prayer is communication with the one who is above all, 
overall. He's young men, young women, when you fall in love, do you just nod at that person? Give hey. Maybe starting off, you do a little wink. And then as you begin to develop that relationship, do you just like give them the cold shoulder? Of course you don't. What happens? You speak. Speaking is the greatest form of intimacy because it's a revel- it's a revealing what's in your heart. You know, I struggle because I'm just a man. And I want to see God do some great things. And I realize my lack. But when I dip myself into prayer, I understand something. All that lack begins to get filled up. The places where I lack. Because that lifeblood is flowing into me. I'm going to take you to a scripture here. <clears throat> it's in Matthew chapter 9, or chapter 6, sorry. It's 9, 13, 9 through 13 and 14. Jesus is going through the Beatitudes and is beginning to sit down and teach the disciples as the multitudes are coming. And it's like Jesus' massive, I don't know, uh, I don't mean this in any, in any disrespectful way, but it's like he's just pouring it out. He goes from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. You know, this is the, basically a Sermon on the Mount. He is just giving and pouring. And he comes to this place in chapter 6. And he says, In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Can we put that up on the screen? Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Can you guys repeat this with me? Some of you should know this by heart. And if you don't, hopefully it's on the screen. Our Father, heart in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On my journey into prayer and realizing my lack and having settled in my heart that I'm going to belong to God and having postured my heart in this way, I realized something that I lack prayer so much in my life. I came to the realization that I was trying to mend people's wounds out of my own care, my own concern, out of my own guidance. And at times, God would be sprinkled in there, enough hopefully to help that person. But I realized really the weight of the results fell on me, not God. And that is not a good thing. There's a reason we need to learn to pray. We need to learn to pray right. We need to learn to pray correctly. And I can't think of a better person to tell me how to pray than Jesus. (laughs) He says, so I, I, I began praying this every morning. Because I need guidance. And I started not looking at it as just words on a paper. But Lord, what do you want to impart into me? What is the truth in this? What does the Spirit of the Lord want to say? How can, how can the Spirit of the Lord change my mindset, change my life? 
I don't want to repeat words, Lord. I, want, I need life. And he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So where's your hunger? If you're, what, and what is your appetite for? Settle in your hearts today whose you are. Let your hunger grow. I'm on a journey. My Father in heaven, I just personalize it. It's what I do. My Father. Why my Father first? When I walk into my parents' house and I see my father and my mother, or my brothers and my sisters, I know I belong. It's a greeting into belonging. It's a, recon it's a recognizing of my place and my position without needing to be told anything else. I can say, if I know that's my father, then I know I belong. It's a greeting. My father. Holy is your name. You know what one of the problems with us churches is, is we don't treat God like he's holy. There's a lack of fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of... God's not to be trifled with. Yes, he loves you and he's redeemed you, but he is not your buddy. He's your father. We don't instruct the Lord. The Lord instructs. He's holy. In the Old Testament, if you went into the Holy of Holies and you weren't welcome, what would happen? You would die instantly. As a matter of fact, when the high priest would go in, does anyone know what they would do? They'd tie a rope around their leg, just in case. Because the bodies would pile up. Because you aren't going in there. That's what holiness is. Holiness means separated. Set apart. Consecrated. Sanctification. That's what we need. If you don't believe God's holy, you won't be holy. If you don't believe God's untouchable, you won't believe that God is going to protect you. Because God is powerless if he's not holy. If he's not above all, then he's not all powerful. Holiness of God. This changes your demeanor. Because the first thing I said was father. And I know my belonging. You should know your place. Know your place. And then know that you don't deserve that place because he's holy. It's not on your own merit. It's not because you want it. You didn't get saved because you wanted to get saved. You got saved because the Father drew you to Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God says. Jesus says, none will come to me unless the Father draws them. That none. That's a holy God who makes holy decisions that I don't get to argue with. I don't know why some people get healed and some people die. That's beyond me. I don't understand it. But it doesn't bother me. Because I know God's good. We all go to the same reward. It just seems like God hits the pause button and gives people extra time sometimes. And maybe that's because that's just what they needed. It says, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've come to realize something. Are you on a truth journey or a happiness journey? This is where the rubber hits the road. Are you on a truth journey or are you on a happiness journey? 
What's the difference? When you first get saved, you come into God's kingdom and you're on a truth journey. God, I want what you want. God, I don't have answers. I form a submission to God. And then, as time goes on, you get bumped. It's something. I don't know what your bump is. And sometimes you get bumped again and again and again. And then your journey turns into a truth journey slash happiness journey. And you go, God, I want your truth, but I also want to be happy. And you, what you do inadvertently is you begin to build your own kingdom inside of God's. That's what you attempt. God, I'll love you if the ifs come. God, I'll love you if you heal. God, I'll love you if whatever. But what you need to understand is, is there's three kingdoms. This is the kingdom of God, which is eternal and everlasting. There's your kingdom of flesh, which is your own pursuits and desires. And there's the kingdom of darkness. And inadvertently, our kingdom of flesh is submitted to darkness. You cannot please God in the flesh. You have to submit yourself to the spirit. I'll read a scripture for you. Gosh darn it. Therefore, there is, this is familiar. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and we stop. Doesn't that sound wonderful? But it continues on. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ if, if you walk by the Spirit. And what we try to do is, is we try to bring our flesh and build our, build our kingdom in God's kingdom. And, he, and here's the thing. God does not care about your happiness. I know that hurts. He doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your joy. What is happiness? Happiness is external things. I can have a cup of ice cream and eat it and I'm happy until I want more ice cream and I don't have any, then I'm not happy. Then I'm sad, Joe. I'm happy. I'm happy because I got that raise. God, oh, you're blessing me. And then I'm not happy when I lose my job. Oh, God, you're not good anymore. You're building your kingdom in God's kingdom. And unfortunately, you've set yourself up for failure because God won't allow that. So what does God have to do? Not because he wants to. God has to destroy your happiness. You've set God in a, in a place. You call him Lord, and rightfully so. So he's going to be Lord, and he is going to destroy your happiness. Because with, when your eyes are on happiness, you'll never discover joy. The word of God says the joy of the Lord is our But we're trying to bring our own strength into God's kingdom. God, this is what makes me feel strong. This is how I'm going to walk this walk, Lord. No, you're going to walk it in humility and in surrender like every other child because God is holy and we don't trifle with what Father says. Forgive us our debts, or wait, sorry, 
Give us this day our daily bread. What is daily bread? I mean, come on. It seems a little daily bread. Like, God, am I hungry? Do I need to go to the grocery store today? I'm hearing him. I'm laying, I'm praying. This is the first thing I pray. Do I, do I, is the first thing God wants me to worry about running to the grocery store and getting food for the day? No, that would distract me from my prayer. It's silly, right? I know. What else came daily as bread? There was something. In the Old Testament, it was manna from heaven. God has provision for you spiritually. I'm sure we could throw physical things in, but God's, God wants to feed your spirit. You're at a deficit every day you wake up. And here's the thing. In the Old Testament, the manna, he said, just for the day, just for the day, don't try to save it for tomorrow. And guess what they did? They did that. Like some people are like, ha ha, going to have me manna all week. One day's worth of work all week. Nope. It rotted and it had maggots. Fresh word for a fresh day. So God, speak to me fresh and anew today. I'm not worried about tomorrow. I'm not worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got the worries of its own. But today, transform me. Feed me because I lack, God. It's acknowledging, God, I need you today. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is the only thing in the Lord's Prayer that we do. Everything else, we're asking. But Jesus is teaching us something here. This is the only thing you do in the Lord's Prayer. Your Lord, your Master, your God, your Holy One. He says, we are to say, forgive us our debts. And the charge is, the contingency is, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. That is the only thing you do. I think that's a pretty important thing to notice. The Lord is saying right there, the most important thing you can do, as a matter of fact, it's pretty much smack dab in the middle of the prayer. So you could almost fold it up like a book right there. I would say it hinges on forgiveness. Do you want to pray to God? You better be walking in forgiveness. You better lay bare your heart before God and you better get it all out. You better root, chase every root and get it before the Lord and submit it to him. Because without forgiveness, I don't know if there is prayer. I I really don't believe prayers can succeed without forgiveness. And this is a daily prayer. This is, how we should, this is how we should live. This is how we should structure our life. Lord, today, people are going to sin against me. That's the world we live in. But Lord, please forgive me because I know I'm going to do the same. I'm not going to do everything right today. I'm not going to hit a home run today. And if I do, it's only because he filled all the gaps. <laughs> He's only going to fill those gaps if I'm praying. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. God, don't take me to the tool shed. God, please spare me from walking the broad path. Keep me on the narrow path today, Lord. Keep me on the tried and true way. Lord, help me not to do my own thing. Deliver us from evil, from the ways of the world. You live in the world, but you're not supposed to be of it. But you can't resist that. 
You can't resist the world unless you got God batting in your corner. And here's the thing. You have to invite him every day. And then he says, at the end of this, cap it off with remembrance. For yours is the kingdom, not mine. Yours is the power, not mine. Yours is the glory, not mine. Forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses. So what he really wants to tell you about prayer... <laughs> He said it in the prayer, and he book hinged it in it. And now, this is the, he's like, and by the way, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. You think God's going to forgive you if you hold bitterness, anger, or resentment? If someone owes you something, you're not free. Freely give, freely receive, freely give. That's the way it works. A lot of times we'll do illustrations in church where we'll have a cup. And we'll be like, God's going to fill that cup. That's you. Until it overflows. And that's okay. But the problem is, is, what happens? This is our nature. We let that cup get, oh, just to that brim for us. And then we stop asking God to fill it. Because we're full. Oh, I'm so full of God. Oh, it's so good. That's dead sea Christianity. That's dead Christianity. That's selfishness. Because here we are, making it about us. Oh, God, thank you for filling me. Oh, is that God's heart? It's said that while we were still sinners, what? Christ died for us. He doesn't want to just die for you, friend, brother, sister. It's not about just you. You're in. You believe. We're saved. It's, it's got to go beyond this mentality. Just fill my cup, Lord. What we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to drill a hole so that we can learn to pray. Earnest prayer makes earnest men. And as God fills the cup, just enough. Just enough to water as we go. Just enough to always give. To break the cycle. We've got to break the cycles of selfish Christianity. There's a parable of talents where a master gave each servant. Some invested brought back a return. One did not. Do you want to be that, that servant? Do you just want saved? What good is salvation if you just, if it's just, do you, do you really think the Lord wants us to be selfish? No. Because just being saved just for you is about your happiness Being saved for God brings joy. And God's a giver, not a taker. We got to break the Dead Sea version of our Christianity where we say, Lord, just enough for me. The reason we come to church and there's such heaviness is because we're not praying. A, a church that doesn't pray is a dead church. A church that doesn't pray is a, a Christian who doesn't pray is a dead Christian. It's a carnal Christian. 
It's a person who lives in their flesh. You know the grace of God, you know the goodness of God, but you deny the power, the power of God that you can tap to. See, you're a conduit. You are a conduit for God. You know the Lord, and you can reach up and grab his hand at any time, but God's heart is not just to connect with you. It's to activate you into purpose and to place because that, this reaching God is our happiness. This is God's joy. When Christianity becomes about me and mine, that's my happiness. God will destroy that. You will go through trials and tribulations. That's not a bad thing to want. Listen, happiness is not a bad thing to want, but it has to stem from joy. It has to grow from joy. It has to be a byproduct of joy. Joy is based in purpose. Prayerless men. Or hollow men. Hollow men leave hollow lives. Hollow men pray faithless prayers. They're whitewashed tombs. They bear the image of God, but they deny his power. How so? Because we won't allow him to fill us. And so we're just as hollow as this. Flesh men are like an apple. They're all flesh through and through. But in that flesh, there's a seed, a seed of hope, the seed of Christ planted in them. The good word can abide but the flesh has to die in order for the seed to get nourishment, to grow. And God wants to make us holy, something else. Holy, something else. Change is not coming unless we're praying. Unless we're a praying people and praying people with a forgiving and a repentant heart. Some of us in here, we've, we've done Christianity a long time. And we know what we should do, but we don't do it. And the word says, if you know what to do and you don't do it, that's sin. It's the ultimate form of selfishness. I want you to consider your Lord. In the garden there was a tree. Man partook of that tree and he died spiritually. And he began to live in the flesh. And God presents us with another tree. You can partake of it and learn to live spiritually and die to your flesh. But the choice has and always will be yours. What do you want? Do you want life? We can't be chameleon Christians. Is this what you want for yourself? To look beautiful? To be displayed? but to have nothing in you and to suffer in silence, to suffer alone because you have to uphold this beautiful image. So what do we do? We just hide our brokenness in shame. We just hide it 
until we get so broken, we can't hide it anymore. God's calling us from some things. You know, God loves us in such a way. It's like Peter in the boat. The boat was fine. The boat float. The boat wasn't going to sink. Everyone else was in the boat. Sometimes God calls us out of things that are perfectly fine. But we make God sometimes destroy. Go, God, show me this is really you. Show me. Why, why do we get that way? Because we don't pray. Listen. I tried reading God's word before I got saved. But it didn't hit right until I got the Spirit. Because I learned what the voice of God sounds like as he was speaking to my spirit. And then, when I read, I'm like, God, you're showing me your character and nature. And now that I'm living in the Spirit, see, truth and Spirit, Jesus said what? Those who worship me, worship me in what? Spirit Spirit and truth. Truth and spirit. I was taught this in my early Christian years. It's like a railroad track. You can't have spirit without truth, and you can't have truth without spirit. There's a great debate in Christianity. Calvinism versus Arminianism. You can't have one without the other. You take one away, and what's left? One validates the other because it's a pop opposing and opposite views. And bes- beside the way, I don't get up in all that mess because I don't worship man. I don't worship someone's ideas of God. I worship God. I let God define who he is. And some things, there are truths on both sides. But why would I spend my life my precious hours involving myself in a debate when God settled it all. Prayer puts us in a place, it puts us in a posture that God, you are holy. God, you are my father. God, you have everything I need. You're beyond man's wisdom. Prayerless men are dead men. And when I say men, mankind is what I'm speaking of. Women, I don't want you ladies to be offended. I'm not that way. I'm just saying. Our kind has God made us. If you're not praying, you're dying. And who wants a zombie hanging around? Who wants a zombie hanging around, half dead, half alive? You stink. I stink if we live that way. You know what I'm saying? What is zombie Christianity? It's having a form of godliness, knowing what God requires and not doing it. And then, small kingdom mentality Oh, I like only that worship. I like, I like this. I like, if you read the word, it won't take you long to find that Christ wants you to live in unity. Not in division. Not in division. I want to invite you into a prayerful life because God's got to build this house. Craig, can't build this house. He can't do all the heavy lifting for you. I don't care if you have 20 pastors. We can't do it. Because man can't do it. Because what we're we're aspiring to comes from an entirely different place than we've ever known. Unless the Lord builds it, we're laboring in vain. 
How do we know God's going to build it? We have to become men and women of prayer. We've had prayer meetings here. I want to know where's the prayer warriors at. Because what you sow in tears, you reap in joy. What you sow, you will reap. You sow prayers for salvation, God will begin moving in lives for salvation. It's the lifeblood. Don't cut yourself off from God. No one wants to lose a hand, a foot, an eye, nobody. We want to be healthy and we want to be whole. We're not healthy and whole yet. There's people here who belong here who aren't here. Why are they not here? Because we're cutting ourselves off from the lifeblood that would take us to them. If you got in prayer, you'd be surprised at the things God would speak to your heart. Church, join me. I'm asking you, please. Man can't do this. Only the Holy Spirit can. I can't save a soul, but I know the one who can. I can't open a blind eye, but I know one who can. And to that matter, I will say this, coming up on closing here, is that go ahead and play that song, brother. See, God is holy. Remove yourself from the familiarity of what you think you know. There's a holy place where a holy God dwells in eternity. There's a holy God who has a holy calling. Are you a whosoever? If there's some of you who want to come up here and have a conversation with the Lord as a public expression of that, as a public form of repentance, feel free to come on up. We're going to play this song. Because this is the place prayer will lift you to. It's a place enthroned in eternity that defies all your own logic. It defies your own ways. Will you settle in your heart today that you belong to this Lord? Would you submit yourself to his Lordship? Think of the greatness Think of the great things God could do through us if we let him build this house. What's this created for? To how many? Two. Jesus says, my what is easy. And my burden is, does this look light? It's because when God's teaching you, he carries the load. We have to come under to be trained. We have to, we don't know. Prayer yokes us with the Lord. Prayer teaches us the Lord's burden. Prayer teaches us how to walk forward. Prayer teaches us how to be productive. Prayer is the yoke that you can join Christ in. And it doesn't matter, big, small, great, none of that matters. It doesn't matter your social status, it doesn't matter your abilities. You can be able-bodied or handicapped, but you can move great things with this. I'll leave you with this. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by, hear the word of the Lord. And what is faith for? It's to stoke the furnace of prayer. Amen. Love you all. Thank you.